Uh, my name is Phil Bernstein. I'm a vice president at Autodesk. We're a technology company that makes software for architects, engineers, and contractors around the world. Well, I guess I would say there are several benefits. Um, first is the degree of clarity of the uh, understanding of design. And not just that two, two dimensional representations are harder to understand than three dimensional representations or that plans and sections and elevations aren't as clear as 3D models. But the ability to interact with the description of the building in numerous ways so people from various perspectives can understand it is a huge advantage. It also happens to be a terrific uh, drawing generator. I mean, the, the quality of the information extractable from a building information model is significantly higher than a more traditional process. So you get the benefits of sort of both insight and productivity. Well, you know, we have a very large network of resources that we use to work with our clients who are architects and engineers. We have web-based training resources. There are, there's information included in the product itself. We have training center, seminars. In, uh, we have a consulting services organization that goes out and helps practices do implementation. And probably our most valuable resource is we have a network of thousands of uh, sales partners who sell our products. And in order to sell our products, they have to be trained and qualified to support them. And they provide support and training to people who are doing implementation. So you see uh, us trying to use our resources to help folks understand how to use these tools in all, in all sorts of different ways. We provide all of our software, for example, is available free to students. So any student of architecture anywhere in the world who wants to use Revit on her projects, for example, can download a free copy and use it. So we try to spread that um, wealth of information as widely as we can. Well, the, pr the process of designing and building a piece of software is very similar to the process of designing and building a building. You interact with your clients, who in our case are customers, by talking to them at length, uh, producing prototypes and testing those prototypes when they're present, um, trying to have a few very close relationships with firms whose advice you value, and we then collect all of these ideas that, we, that are provided to us and map them onto what we believe to be the longer scale, longer term trends in the industry. So it's not just a question of making a list of everything everybody's asking for and then prioritizing it and sticking it in the software. The software is also influenced by what we think are bigger trends in the industry. So we know that, for example, digital fabrication is going to become increasingly important. So we're look, even though not a lot of people are doing it, we're looking at functionality that supports digital fabrication. And then from that information, you make a design. But the difference between building a building and building a piece of software is a building, a building process is usually roughly one-third design and two-thirds construction. Our process is a third design, a third construction, and a third testing. So we take a third of the amount of time that we have to do a release, and we test it with users, beta users, we have thousands of them, who test the product and give us immediate feedback about what they think is working and doesn't work. It doesn't work. So the process is very heavily vetted. Well, I mean, I think we do it at sort of three levels. One is we are trying to be engaged with the industry in a dialogue about important trends. So people like myself who are relatively senior and experienced in the building industry try to provide the technology business's perspective on what we see happening in the industry. So we try to be involved in that dialogue, and we do it by participating in symposia, writing papers, um, participating in industry standards boards, uh, meeting with large groups of our customers. I'm, I'm a regular speaker around the world at these sorts of things. Um, and also by demonstrating these principles in our own projects. We've recently built two of our own projects, one here in San Francisco and one in Boston, where we incorporated some of these ideas. Um, secondly, we try to support research and practices that we think are focused on these kinds of leading edge ideas. So we have relationships with firms like um, McKinstry, Sharples, Holden, and Pascarelli, um, 
con contractors like Hoctif, um, who are doing advanced things with our software to try to understand what's happening. And then finally, we put the capabilities in the software to make them available so people can do the work. So if you look at what we're doing, for example, around sustainable design, around the, uh, the acquisition of Ecotech, uh, the incorporation of Green Building Studio into our design tools, we th think that if we make those tools available on the desktops of designers and make them easily usable, then we can make it easier for people to design sustainable buildings, and they will do so. You know, we make tools. We don't make buildings. You know, we have to be, we we have a building industry group that I work with that supports architects and engineers and contractors. There's a whole other group that serves the manufacturing industry. They actually happen to be experts in digital fabrication. So we've been incorporating their knowledge, their tools, their methods in some of our uh, solutions, creating relationships between their tools and our tools. So somebody could use a manufacturing tool to develop a curtain wall, for example, and then convert that curtain wall into a Revit design and put it into their Revit model. So, and the same thing is happening in our, um, we have a group that does media and entertainment. The media and entertainment group does a lot of high-end visualization and simulation of stuff. So, for example, we've incorporated their daylight simulation tools for our, as part of our sustainability toolkit. Turns out when you do a rendering in 3D Studio Max, the physics of how it renders sunlight is extremely accurate. So it doesn't just make the desk surface look as if it would look with these lights coming on. You can actually extract that data and use it as part of the design process. So if your sustainable design requirements say that you have to have a certain number of foot candles on a desk surface, you can, we can use our, our movie making tools to simulate that and we're starting to incorporate those technologies in our stuff. Well, you know, the Fed, the, the, the General Services Administration, which is the, the guys that run all the federal buildings, have been studying building information modeling for five years now. And they've been incorporating BIM requirements in their normal projects for two, um, two years, almost three years now. So the idea, and it, it just so happens that they've chosen a series of issues that they want to use building information modeling to address. The first one prior to the green building standard was space management. They want people to make building information models so we, they can understand how much space is in the buildings. The second one that they happen to be interested in is energy. And this happened independently of the stimulus package. So when there was a decision made to begin spending stimulus money to upgrade federal buildings around energy, it corresponded exactly with what the GSA was doing anyway. And it makes perfect sense because a building information model is a excellent mechanism for rapidly assessing the energy consumption of a building and deciding what the strategy is for making it more efficient. The other option is to go out with a bunch of tape measures, make a bunch of plans and sections and elevations, and then use a bunch of spreadsheets, which is like a 19th century approach using 20th century tools for a 21st century problem. So I, it, it makes perfect sense to me. It's completely rational, in my opinion. Well, I, I, my recommendation would be twofold, right? It, that most of the focus on the use of digital tools in the past has been about form making. It's been about making extraordinary things that you couldn't, that were too hard to make by hand. And a lot of the interest in uh, what Bob Stern, who's the dean at the School of Architecture where I teach, um, uh, call, he calls these guys the blobmeisters, people who like to make blobs. You know, Greg Lynn, Frank, these guys, the people that like blobby things. That's actually not the problem set that architects need to be focused on. It's interesting theoretically. It's interesting aesthetically and formally. It is not the core problem set. The core problem set is how to design better, more responsive, more environmentally appropriate, more precise buildings that meet clients' requirements. If that's going to happen, then students have to turn their attention to two sets of issues. One is around representational and analytical tools, and the other is around digital fabrication tools. And by representational tools, I mean tools that help you understand how a building goes together and tools that help you understand how it performs. Those are skills that someone is going to bring to the table. If architects don't do it, then somebody else will. And the danger is, 
If we don't begin to understand the representational issues and the analytical issues, and at the same time begin to grasp how to use these tools to digitally fabricate buildings, someone else will figure all that out, and then all we'll be left with is the shape making. We'll become professional shape makers, and someone else will do the analysis, someone else will work out all the technical problems, someone else will work out all the digital fabrication issues, and we'll just become uh, stylists. And I think that's a real possibility if, our, if, if this generation of architects doesn't really embrace the implications of these tools. These, these tools have huge implications for the way buildings are described, how they're designed, and how they are built. And architects have to decide whether they're going to be in the middle of that or not. And if you say no, just be clear about what that means about your role. Because you're going to be making shapes, but somebody else, else, somebody else in my view, is going to be building them. And this is what I tell my students. I tell my students that you must grasp project delivery issues, you must grasp representation issues, or you're going to lose your place at the table. Well, there's, there's a ton of stuff out there. I mean, Google BIM and you'll get a jillion hits. Um, there are classes. Um, there are, um, there's a lot of uh, material being written. Most of the professional associations are starting to do training and consciousness. This is not an optional thing. You know, I'm old enough that I saw this happen in the CAD transition. And as the, as the building industry was making a transition to CAD, which began happening in the mid-1980s and lasted until the early part of the 1990s, we had two recessions in this country. And at the end of the second recession, anybody who was not CAD capable could not get a job. If you didn't know how to do AutoCAD by 1993 or 1994, after we'd come out of those two dips, you weren't employable. So the older guys that said, ah, you know, this is just a passing fad or it's just a fancy drafting machine, those people lost their jobs. And I think something similar is going to occur in the building industry around modeling that the folks that choose not to embrace it as a methodology are going to find themselves really seriously behind the curve. And so you have to seek out ways, um, you have to seek out ways to learn how to do this stuff. You know, architects have this funny um, attitude that once they get out of school, they're kind of done. You know, it's not true. Half the people that are at this convention right now are here because they're trying to extend their skills. And in our own, even in our own work at Autodesk, the we run this thing called Autodesk University. It's a big um, training session for five days. Last year there were 8,000 people. Three years ago, when we ran our, four years ago, when we ran our first BIM training sessions, we had like 12 people. Last year there were 1,000. It just, it's out there. It's very easy to get to. I strongly recommend that people go figure this out. Well, I mean, there's so many of those projects out there, it really depends on what, what question you're talking about. But, yeah, all right, so let's talk about our project. So well, we just finished this project. It was finished just a few weeks ago. We did um, 6,000 square meters of space in a building in Boston. It's $13 million, lead platinum, all Revit, from beginning to end in seven months. We did the whole job in seven months from the day the architects and the contractor signed the contract to when we moved into the building was seven months. Uh, and we, it came in on budget. It exceeded its quality. It's probably going to get a LEED Platinum certification. People are really, really happy. All of us are still friends that worked on the project, and it looks fantastic. Um, and uh, we believe that we extracted 5 to 10 percent of additional value from the construction money that was spent just by virtue of the fact that it was a model-based project. But, you know, we don't, I don't, I, I don't really keep these stories around anymore because there's so, there, there's 400,000 copies of Revit out there now. There's thousands of projects being done all over the world. I just got back, I just got back from Brazil where I was shown probably 30 Revit jobs that are under construction right now. So there's, there's just, it's too much to keep an eye on. It'd be, it'd be like if you asked me, you know, what was the best AutoCAD job ever done?
I, I, I'm not sure I would interpret it as we're going to focus more on the user a interface to the exclusion of other things. But what we have decided is that in order to make the tool as accessible as possible and to make it usable by the maximum number of people and to make it easier to move from one of our tools to another, we need to rationalize the interfaces. Because all of our tools came from different directions, right? AutoCAD came in one direction, 3D Studio Max came from another, Inventor another, Revit a fourth. And it's a little crazy. I mean, you know, it looks like these tools were created on different planets. And what's beginning to happen now is that our customers are starting to need, our customers would regularly use a copy of Revit, a copy of AutoCAD, a copy of 3D Studio Max, maybe a copy of Inventor. Why should they have three or four or five or six different ways to do a dimension line or rotate a 3D object in space? We're trying to make that experience more consistent, more predictable for people who are experienced users. And for the new users, you know, you don't have to, it's like, you know this term hazing, you know what hazing is? When, they, when you join a fraternity and they like spank you with, with bats? You shouldn't have to go through a hazing process to learn how to use a piece of software just because people didn't spend enough time designing the interface. You know, we're hearing a lot of feedback, both positive and negative, from our really experienced Revit users about the changes in the interface. Some are happy about it, they think it's a good idea. Others are furious because all that terrible stuff that they got so used to using is gone. It wasn't a great interface. We knew it when we started the project. We've just gotten to the point now where rather than redesign the Revit interfa interface all by itself, you know, we sat down with the Max team, we sat down with the AutoCAD team, we sat down with the Inventor team. We all worked out a common strategy for doing an interface.